So Gladys uh, is going to talk to us about math. Hi, everyone. My name is Gladys, and I'm going to talk to you about how to talk about math, um, and specifically about how to talk about math to general audiences. So the biggest complaint that mathematicians, math majors, and the non-mathematically minded have about most math talks is that they don't present the big picture. Um, you can understand certain individual lines of a proof, but you just don't see the big picture. Or the talk just doesn't help the audience build intuition about a mathematical concept. Again, they just get lost in the nitty gritty of the proof. Also, um, it's a pitfall to use vague language. You're not doing your audience a favor by using vague language because it creates unnecessary confusion for audiences that have no context about the subject matter. Also, it's very important to use simple but realistic examples to illustrate concepts. What I mean by simple is that the examples you use should be small and simple enough so that the audience can see the big picture and build intuition, but at the same time, the examples should be realistic. They should not be made up cartoon examples because most people who are listening to math talks want to get a sense of the types of problems that real mathematicians actually work on. So now I'm going to put these principles into action by talking about my favorite topic in math, which is group theory. So what is a group? A group consists of two things. It's a set, G, and an operator star with the following four properties. And by set, I mean a set, uh, just a collection of um, numbers, variables, or functions. It doesn't matter what's inside that set as long as the set satisfies the group axioms. And similarly, it doesn't matter what the operator is. It can be addition, multiplication, function composition, or some combination of the three, as long as the operator satisfies the group axioms. And so there are four group axioms. Closure. That means that for all elements A and B and G, A star B is also in G. So it means that the group is self-contained. Second axiom, identity. There exists a unique element E such that E star A equals A star E for all A and G. So if you're thinking about addition, the identity is zero. For multiplication, the identity is one. Third axiom, inverse. For every element A and G, there exists a unique element B such that A star B equals B star A equals E or the identity. So again, if you're thinking of addition, uh, the inverse of any number is just the negation of that number. If you're thinking of multiplication, the inverse of a number is just one divided by that number. Fourth axiom is associativity. So what this means is that if you have any three elements in your group G, if you compose A with B, take the result of that and compose it with C, it's the same as if you're composing A with the result of composing B and C. So why should people learn about groups other than that they're a lot of fun? Group theory has a wide range of applications. In computer science, group theory is applied to robotics, computer vision, animation, and cryptography. Chemists use group theory to study the structure of molecules and crystals. Physicists use group theory to study subatomic particles. And believe it or not, group theory also has applications in music. Now let's look at some examples of groups. One important group is called S3, and that is the group of permutations of an array of length 3. And this group consists of um, all possible ways that you can rearrange three elements. And say that our array consists of A, B, and C, and again, it doesn't matter what A, B, and C are. Uh, we've got the identity element, which is the permutation that just leaves the array as is. We'll call that E. We have R1, which is going to take the first element and push it to the end of the array. We have R2, which takes the first two elements and pushes them to the end of the array. We've got M1, which will fix the first element but swap the second and third elements. M2 will fix the second element but swap the first and third elements and M3 will fix the third element but swap the first and second elements. 
So why does S3 satisfy the group axioms? First of all, there is the existence of the identity permutation. Um, and secondly, oh, uh, it is closed because if you just take uh, any two permutations and then you combine them, you get another permutation. So hence you have closure. And you also have the inverse property, which is any uh, element in this group has an inverse. And the inverse of identity is always identity. And if you look at R1 and R2, these uh, permutations are actually each other's inverse. Because if you look at what's happening in R1, if you push the first element to the end of the array, and then you push, and then you push the, the two elements to the end of the array, you come full circle, so you get back your original array. And if you look at M1, M2, and M3, um, these are, each of these permutations is its own inverse, because if you swap two elements, and then you swap the same, um, you swap uh, the elements that are in those same positions, again, you just get back your original array. And associativity can also be verified if you can just manually check um, each element of the array. Um, and then uh, another important group in group theory is called D3. And this is the group of symmetries of the equilateral triangle. An equilateral triangle is a triangle with three equal sides. And what a symmetry does is it moves a triangle in such a way that it preserves its orientation and you can't tell that it's moved at all. For example, um, I mean, E is obviously identity. It does nothing to the triangle. If you look at R1, it rotates your triangle by 120 degrees and it's going to end up looking exactly the same. R2 will rotate your triangle 240 degrees and again, it still looks the same. M1 will flip your triangle along uh, the first angle. Um, so we're going to, it's going to flip it along this line here that uh, I'm going to call A. And so it's going to, when you flip it along that line, uh, B and C will swap places. M2 will flip along this line B. So A and C will swap places. And M3 will flip the triangle along this line C. And so A and B are going to swap places. And again, this satisfies the group axioms. There's the identity permutation, which does nothing. And um, each element um, composed with another element gives you back another element of this group. Because of the way we defined this group, um, this group consists of every possible way that you can move a triangle without changing its orientation. So if you perform one symmetry on a triangle, and then you perform another symmetry on a triangle, that's the result is still a symmetry on a triangle, hence you have closure. And um, every element in this group has an inverse. Um, identity is its own inverse, and R1 and R2 are inverses of each other. That's because if you <laughs> rotate a triangle by 120 degrees, and then you rotate it in the same direction by 240 degrees, you've come full circle. So the triangle returns to its original state. And M1, M2, and M3 are each its own inverse. Because if you flip this triangle, for example, along this line once, and then you flip it a second time, the triangle is just going to return to its original position. Same with M2 and M3. And again, associativity can be verified <coughs> manually by just by checking all of these elements of this very small group that consists of just six things. So now many of you might be thinking that these two groups are very similar. And in fact, they are isomorphic to each other. Isomorphic does not mean that they're the same group. D3 consists of actions on a triangle and S3 consists of actions on an array. However, the two groups are interchangeable from a group theoretic standpoint, which means that every group theoretic property that holds true of one group is also true of the other group. So what exactly is a group isomorphism? Suppose that you have two groups, G uh, with the operator star and H with the operator that we're going to call count. 
A group isomorphism is a function f from g to h that satisfies the following three conditions. Each element of g maps to exactly one element of h. And there exists an inverse function of f that maps each element of h to exactly one element of g. Thirdly, the function um, satisfies this property uh, that, uh, that says that it preserves the operation rules for both groups. So if you're taking um, your function f and you're applying it to a composed with b, where a and b are in g, the result of that is f of a star, <laughs> sorry, f of a um, um, pound f of b. So it's, uh, so your mapping has to preserve the structure of both groups. And if there's a group homomorphism, uh, sorry, isomorphism between g and h, g is isomorphic to h and vice versa. So S3 and D3 are isomorphic. And um, we can define the isomorphism between these two groups in the following very natural way. The identity naturally maps to the identity. And um, R1, which is uh, the, the permutation where you're just taking the first element and pushing it to the end of your array, is actually analogous to rotating your triangle by 120 degrees. And R2 maps to R, uh, sorry, uh, the permutation R2 maps to the rotation R2. So if you're taking the first two elements of your array and pushing them to the end of your array, that's very similar to rotating your triangle by 240 degrees. And M1 is where you, um, is the permutation where you, you fix one, the first element, but you swap the other two. Very similar to M1, which is the symmetry where you're fixing one angle, but you're swapping the other two angles, and so on. And that concludes my talk. Thank you for listening.